everyone! Welcome back to Obscurus Lupa Presents. Yep, we're still doing this. Witchcraft 666? Oh lordy. If there were 666 of these things, I'd crap myself. So, this is actually the sixth in the series, also subtitled The Devil's Mistress. You might notice a devil theme in the series. You also might have noticed the last William was pretty cardboardy. That was the awesomely named Marklin Kennedy, who's done a handful of acting gigs since and produced the Showtime series Gigolos. I'm sure you can guess the content. He's also an ordained minister and has a daughter named Barbecue. Barbecue. I want to know this man. Unfortunately, he wasn't a very good William. This time around, it's Jerry Spicer, who's mostly known for his stunt work. He's actually been in some pretty amazeballs bad films, like Highlander 2 and the Roger Corman Fantastic Four. But alongside that, he's been in more high-profile recent stuff, like The Sorcerer's Apprentice. Good for you, dude. He also reminds me a bit of Martin Short, which is the one superficial thing I took away from his performance. And it looks like somebody is on their period! This is the installment that introduces us to Lutz and Garner, two cops that will become important supporting characters for the rest of the series. Well, as important as any character is in the Witchcraft series, anyway. Garner is the one with the mustache, Lutz is the one with the magnificent Shadow Stevens hair. Jesus Christ, Garner. If you're sick, go to the hospital. It's the damn Mexican food. I can't do anything about it. Oh yeah, and they have comic relief cop banter. Witchcraft 6, everybody! It seems there's been a string of murders lately, but the fuzz can't figure it out. Enter Lutz and Garner, detectives extraordinaire. Oh yeah, she's warm. Like a donut straight out of the oven, huh? Trying to decipher if donut cop joke or his theme is just food. I'll keep you updated. Not a bad look, huh? Jesus Christ, Garner. The poor girl is dead and you think she's worth the roll in the hay. Or I could eat her. <laughs> Luckily, these two have the help of their overbearing captain. Two smart-ass cops with an uptight boss? Say it isn't so! She looks like she's in a trance. She's dead. How is that a trance? The captain seems pissed that they don't know what's going on, but come on, dude. All you could come up with was she's in a trance. They already have her name and age figured out, and that she's been embalmed, and she's not even cold yet. That's some pretty damn good detective work. And I bet she smells delicious. Goddamn miracle the press hasn't gone public with this. Really? Because the movie opened with a report on the radio about these murders. And you. Wipe that shit-eating grin off your face. He's not grinning. Does the captain's dialogue match up with anything that's actually happening in this? We are making progress. We're pursuing numerous leads, and we believe we have that- have leads? Arrest somebody! Don't give me this Marianne shit about, we got numerous leads! Jesus! They've got a bunch of information and leads on this. How is this not progress? Do they not know how real homicide investigations go? These have to be the best detectives in the world! Find a new boss, guys. He threatens to throw them off the case if there's another murder because, I don't know, that was the most cliché thing to do. Lutz and Garner look ready to either kill each other or make out in every scene. It's great. Oh man, more food! Looks like this is gonna be one yummy case. Um, why are they getting their drinks in Wendy's cups? Could they not turn the label away from the camera? While the odd couple is too stooging it up, Sleezoid McGee is using his sweet salt shaker skills to talk up a sexy lady. Have you ever had a screaming orgasm? What? Well, it's a drink. Oh, I don't drink alcohol. Who said it was a drink? Um, you did. Like, just now. Apparently this tactic of confusion works and she brings him home. She's supposed to be this shy virgin type, but this is like the flimsiest virgin I've ever seen. You didn't even try, movie. I mean, come on, you're just gonna get her naked less than a minute after that anyway. No, not the tomato juice! Wanna have sex? I'm a virgin! Who said I wanted sex? While this is going on, Lutz and Garner are doing some detective work, and the movie is either terrible with continuity, or they had the world's longest trip to the station. They state they've been working this case for four weeks, but the report on the radio said that two girls had been found in one week. Seeing as the captain stated the latest girl was the third body, that means either Lutz and Garner were driving for three weeks, or that radio station was reporting on a body that hadn't even turned cold yet. That or Sleezoid and that girl are flirting in the diner for three weeks. And donuts, because hey, cops! Can't be cops without donuts! I don't want to be sitting here looking at your picture next week. Haha, 
Ah, it's funny because there's a serial killer who preys on women. Garner notices a pentagram on the stomach of one of the victims. Wait, no one seriously saw that for four weeks of looking at those photos? Or noticed it on the bodies at the crime scene? They went from being the world's greatest detectives to the worst in less than 15 minutes. This wasn't on the coroner reports. They actually ask for new shots from the coroner because this has not come up before now. That's really hard to miss, guys. I'd fire Coroner Magoo like now. Jesus. I'm expecting the second coming with how many times they call out to Jesus in this thing. You know cops have other cliched catchphrases, right? It turns out the creepo diner guy is not on the up and up and kidnaps the virgin. Now we have time for him to have sex in the car with his girlfriend. Thank God. I was worried we were going to have more plot. Lutz and Garner figure these are ritual killings having to do with the occult, so they ask for a list of people that have helped with the cult cases at the department. Their co-worker singles out William. What the hell's a divorce lawyer gonna know about the occult? Don't you ever read the papers? This guy Spanner's helped the department out with the occult before. Word is his father was some kind of high-ranking devil worshiper. There's that wonderful continuity, hey -o! Okay, so William is a divorce lawyer now? I guess he moved away from insurance cases. Secondly, when did he help the department with cases on the occult? The closest we got to that was in part four, when he illegally investigated that girl's disappearance, but that ended with the cop letting him go to take the credit. I'm pretty sure William has always kept that occult thing on the down low. I can't figure out why or when he'd help the police with this stuff. And thirdly, even if they knew about William's birth father being a devil worshiper, that doesn't mean William would know shit about the occult, seeing as he died shortly after he was born. And wouldn't they also know about William's adoptive parents being murdered under mysterious circumstances? All in all, I'd say he's not the best choice to bring in on the case. We're going home. Not together. At least not tonight, anyway. And only a third of the way into the film, let's meet our new William. In a shocking bit of continuity for this series, William is still with his fiancée, Kelly. She sticks around for quite a while, too. Sure, she's a completely different looking actress and might as well be a new character for all of the personality she shows, but it's nice to know someone at least read the synopsis of the last film. Now the question is, did they move out of William's parents' house or did it get remodeled again with an even more extravagant shower? William is having some bad flashback dreams and something to do with eggs. Don't ask me. Lutz and Garner show up and ask him if he'd helped the case. Guys, I'm a divorce lawyer. I deal with dead marriages, not dead women. Man, I really wish I hadn't helped with those other cases, apparently. I also wish my surfer accent impression made any sense. William agrees to help when they get a call about a fourth body, the virgin from earlier. Kelly is adamant about not getting involved, and by that I mean she's sort of lukewarm about it. This new actress is here for her talents. And by talents, I mean boobs. We can't go through this again. We can't run out of milk again. I can't eat my cereal without milk. They check out the new body and discover a pentagram tattoo on her. Whoa, I'm glad they had William there to find that. William either has flashbacks to sex scenes he was not witness to, has psychic flashes of it, or he's thinking of something unrelated and the footage is shown to remind the audience. Take your pick. He says the pentagram can only mean one thing. The devil! Did somebody say comedy montage? When I think of serial killers and Satan, I think comedy. So they bring in several occult experts to interview them and see if they know anything about the case, all the while having William watch to determine if they're real or phony. So why do they believe William knows what he's doing then? He could just as easily be a faker too. And isn't he already their occult expert? Did the captain sanction this? Because I find it hard to believe that the guy ready to fire them earlier would approve of bringing a psychic in. This isn't Captain Stone Tree we're talking about here. Mr. Goober. That is pronounced Joubert. Well, at least it isn't Mr. Gooby. How does the guy who just came in to check out underwear fit in? Did they advertise somewhere for psychics that could get reads on lingerie or something? And surely there are easier ways of doing this than getting involved in the investigation of a serial killer and sniffing the supposed underwear of a dead woman. That's a really specific fetish, dude. So, in summation, the movie just wasted six minutes of your life. They've got just one more psychic left. Colonel, holy fuck nuts, you're stupid if you don't realize he's the villain. He's got two traits, being blindingly albino and having the most fabulous nails in the universe. Seriously, dude's really into his nails. His name is Savanti and he joins Santera and Hammington in the Witchcraft Villains with Eerily Similar Schemes and Motivations Club. William is sure that something's up. 
This might be a clue. That effect is terrible. It must be the work of the devil. They were acting like these other psychics volunteered or something, but clearly this guy doesn't want to be here. So were they annoyed that they invited a bunch of time wasters over, or what? Well, what the hell are you doing here wasting our time, then? You called me. Oh, they did. So... what? William says that the Colonel is their killer, which they don't really seem to take seriously. Then why did they ask for his help? They could at least ask him to elaborate on why he thinks it's this guy. They say they'll at least check out his alibi. Oh, these nails are going to look unbelievable when I'm through. You know, something tells me this is what the Westboro Baptist Church thinks gay people are like. Savanti is way interested in William now. He thinks he's in contact with the next virgin sacrifice because... I don't know. And I don't know where he got this information. So... yeah. He sends out his slutty servant to get William on their side and use his powers to their advantage. So seriously, he's just Hammington without the wonderful overacting. He does have the nail fetish, but that doesn't make up for the fact that Hammington was acting circles around him. In some cultures, they consider the egg to symbolize the human soul. Think of Mr. Spanner as an egg, my dear. So... you want to eat him? Instead of long, boring sex scenes, this woman decides to get to William by pretending to be a client asking for a divorce. If William can prove her husband has been unfaithful, she can get her settlement. Despite seeing a pentagram tattoo on her in the same place he saw it on the corpse, and the fact that she tries to make out with him, he still agrees to take her case. Why? That's strike one for the demonic serial killer, strike two against his professionalism. She says her husband is sleazoid from earlier, and sends William to his work to spy on him. I don't think this is usually what divorce lawyers do. In fact, I know it isn't. Witchcraft. Lawyers and detectives are not the same thing. Oh, I see. It was just an excuse to drug and make out with him, thus making that entire subplot pointless. <laughs> and that happens. What the hell did this accomplish, anyway? You're a lawyer, not an investigator. Now you're pointing it out, too? You don't give two shits, movie, do you? So, if what he's doing is illegal, then all of the proof he found would have been null and void in the courtroom anyway. What is the point? A fourth woman has been murdered. The police are still baffled as no leads have been found. Oh, thank God the press didn't get a hold of that. You got two guesses as to what's on screen next. Boobs? Or delicious chocolate cake. Winner, winner, chicken dinner. Now it's sexy, suspend a time. Whoa, that was dangerously close to a dick there, movie. Watch it. This, of course, turns into angry sex where William tries to kill Kelly. Again. Seriously, guys, you're just gonna remake one of the previous films and five was the one you chose? You could have at least copied one of the good ones, and that bathwater looks nasty as fuck. Oh, I'm well, I guess he said he was sorry. Again. While this is going on, Slutty and Sleezoid grab the next victim and take her to Savanti. They prepare her for some sort of ritual where they try to give her to Satan. It's a complicated matter that involves perfectly manicured nails and keeping all the ugly cult members under their hoods. <laughs> wow, it's stupid and pointless. The master most certainly does not approve. It turns out they're looking for a bride for the head honcho down below, and this girl wasn't the right one either, so she dies. Yeah, it turns out none of the girls so far have been virgins. Wait, so the girl who was the least believable virgin ever was not actually a virgin? So, Sleezoid is just an idiot, I see. All this hoopla has to be accomplished before the eclipse that's coming up, so all the forces of hell can be unleashed and start the apocalypse. I'm just gonna make up some headcanon that Savanti is actually Hammington's son, carrying on where his father left off, but never being able to get his approval. It's time for the captain to start getting on Lutz and Garner's case about this... er... case. You don't even have anybody under arrest! Really you don't even have any fucking suspects! I thought they said they had leads, and he'd rather have someone arrested falsely than actually solve the case? Well, I don't care about how hard you're working, I want to see results. 
Well, we're, uh, we have some results. We do have some results. That's it, okay? You guys are off the case. I want to see results. We do have results. You're off the case. Who said they were results? Seriously, is the captain in another movie entirely? They try to show him the reports, but he doesn't even bother to read them, saying he's handing the case over to another pair of cops. What the hell is he looking for? A guy actually committing the murders in the station? I don't want to find the killer, I just want to find the killer! Who the fuck are you? I'm not even gonna wait for your answer. <laughs> Damn, I'm good. William wants to continue with the case, insisting that Savanti is the killer. Since Garner has walked out of the scene, and coincidentally the movie, William convinces Lutz to continue the investigation anyway. Um, that would be illegal. Savanti says William is the key to their sacrifice. Um, what? This is a new development. No wonder all those other ones failed, they didn't have the spanner touch. Which begs the question as to why he even bothered without him if he knew William was the key. I bet you work extremely fast under the proper circumstances. Stop that, Mrs. Rickless. Stop what? This is not gonna help your case. Does he just have, like, no clients right now? Is he that desperate to keep her around? It turns out it was all a dream. Or was it? It doesn't really matter. Now that we're nearing the end of the movie, we're suddenly supposed to be invested in this character who's had maybe two lines so far. William has a religious, virginal secretary. Oh no! Could she be the next sacrifice? But she's been so well developed so far. I hope she makes it out okay. William gets a call from Slutty's husband, who asks him to meet him at the bar again to make a settlement. Oh, come on, William. The last time you were there, you got drugged. And by this point, he's been told that Savanti owns the bar, a guy he's certain is guilty and or working for the devil. No red flags here, William. Ew. There had to have been, like, a shit ton of dirt under that nail. You know, I'd say this was a pleasure. If it were. Zing! I'd say you were a nice guy. If you were. I'd say this drink was an elephant. If it were. I'd say I was wearing underpants. If I was. While Savanti distracts William at the bar, Slutty and Sleezoid go to William's house to kidnap Kelly, thinking she must be the virgin sacrifice. Um, what? They think William's fiance is a virgin? And she's taking yet another bath. She spends almost the entirety of this movie bathing. On the one hand, she's gotta be super clean, but on the other, she's gonna have some serious prune toes. Slutty goes to William's office to retrieve her purse when she meets his secretary, making the connection that she's the one they need to sacrifice. So, other than her working for William, why is William himself important to this? If all they had to do was find a virgin, they couldn't just go to a convent or something? Sleezoid goes after Kelly and gets stabbed with some scissors, prompting him to run away. Really? That's all it took? He wasn't expecting anyone to actually fight back? William makes the connection that the woman with the pentagram tattoo must have something to do with the murders involving pentagram tattoos. And the phone booth is indeed a phone booth. He goes to the office, finds his secretary kidnapped, and calls Lutz over. What follows is a lot of jumping to conclusions. William deduces that the husband guy is working with Slutty, and that both of them are working for Savanti. They've got to be at the highest point of the city. They've, they've got to be as close to the moon as possible. Well, glad to know he just pulled that one out of his butt. Good to know he knew about this ritual the whole time and didn't use that information in any sort of beneficial manner. Savanti prepares to sacrifice William's secretary to Satan. So really, the whole subplot about seducing William and getting him to go to the dark side again was... not actually a subplot at all, or relevant to anything. It could have been simplified by just distracting him for a while, really. You hear that? Let's separate. A scream? We'll be more effective if we separate and move away from the noise. You're making fun of my nails, aren't you? Aren't you? Prepare the sacrifice. And do not disturb me. There is a bottle of Sally Hansen with my name on it. Oh shit, they just blew the budget. Action lawyer, activate! Ooh, didn't anticipate getting knocked over twice by a tiny woman. She talks about how William can't resist the dark side any longer, but it rings a bit hollow seeing as how it had nothing to do with anything this movie. He stabs her and unties the secretary, which isn't too pleasing for McManicure. Did he kill all of his other goons too? It seems like there should have been more security for the upcoming apocalypse. Then Savanti is... shot by the moon?
Does this mean he's Satan's bride now? Oh hey, I just remembered I was in this movie. Still shot of the moon, anyone? So what do you say we do now, counselor? Feel like seeing a movie? Nah, too much violence. Yeah. Sure could go for some donuts, though. <laughs> what am I gonna do with you lots? Let's get out of here. And a donut joke, which brings this movie to its underwhelming end. Here's the big shocker. None of the actors in this are actually that bad, and that includes the new villain. Jerry Spicer was a bit stiff at times, but for the most part he got the job done. If these same actors had been handed a script with an actual story and build-up, this could have been a decent movie. But really, it's just a copy of Witchcraft 5 with shorter sex scenes and terrible continuity. In fact, the film is practically carried by the actors who played Lutz and Garner, and I'm certain a good chunk of their scenes were improvised. I was actually surprised to see that they both only acted in one other movie. They had a lot of charisma and were genuinely good actors. But the movie itself… it's bad. It's really obvious that they ran out of time to shoot, lost actors, and hastily pasted things together. William barely has anything to do, continuity is all over the place, and the film tends to contradict itself at times. I'd still rank the fifth movie as the worst one, but this one isn't anything to write home about. I hope you enjoyed this review, but who says this was a review? In a world of sexual rituals and supernatural powers, Will he save the world from destruction or die trying Witchcraft 7, Judgment Hour? Blood never tasted so good. What's a drink? Oh, I don't drink alcohol. Who said it was a drink? <laughs>